Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm thrilled to have back with me Dr. Max McCowan. Uh, Dr. Max, I've spoken with previously at one of my summits, and he's a globally recognized expert on strategy and innovation, the author of multiple books, including The Strategy Book, The Innovation Book, Adaptability, and his newest book, The Innovator's Book, uh, which I've got a copy of here. I've gone through myself. And I found really interesting, especially in how it's different to the way that most other innovation books are written. Dr. Max, it's wonderful having you here. It's really good to be talking to you. You're in Berlin, right? I am in Berlin, yeah. So uh, excellent. Hello in Berlin. Hello, Uh, hello. I'm in sunny Yorkshire currently, (laughs) in my own office, surrounded by my my creative crap. Absolutely. So, uh, Max, should I call you Dr. Max? Should I call you Max? What do you prefer? <laughs> Either is just great. Okay. Either is great. Yeah. So, Max, tell, tell us a bit about The Innovator's Book, your most recent book, and uh, why you wrote it in the way that you did. Well, you're, you're, you have your copy, I guess. Yeah, th- this is mine. So, first of all, we're, we're saying this is about my 10th book. And this is by far my shortest and most visual book. And so, as you can see, look how adorable that is. So so ideas of fragile handle with care. And this book outlines the the three jobs of an innovator that an innovator has to do to move from their very first insight all the way through to an idea that uh, is valuable in the world, brings them what they want, becomes popular, d- does the good that, that it can do in the world. So it goes through all of those three jobs. Uh, and I think it is a u- totally unique book, total pleasure to create. And also totally, my third total, it, it fills a an innovation gap that I have noticed that no other book appeared, well, d- d- doesn't fill and wanted to to test that out a big meta experiment in innovation my idea can i make it popular and valuable and useful now i i uh, am very glad i got a copy of the book i read through it in probably less than two hours which for most innovation books is uh, one of the fastest like uh, books i've ever read uh, and i was going through it and i thought this is very uh, very much differently structured to most innovation books which are very heavy on method on theory on case studies uh, whereas yours is a lot more visual and a bit more high level and a bit more sort of abstracted from the the, the bedrock of of how to innovation why, why did you do it that way yeah well uh, right, right at the start i don't know is this backwards Nick? no no i, I can see tell. it well, yeah but but so so at the front i say hello you know that this is it, it the book talking to you this book is as short as possible and so, first of all, I, I tried to follow Pascal's dictum, later repeated by Twain, that, do you remember that letter? He writes a letter and he says, sorry, it wasn't shorter. I didn't have time to shorten the letter. So suggesting that uh, making something concise, abridging something, takes effort. It's actually easier to write and write and write and write and write and write. The next stage is to remove, to, to uh, like sculpting to kind of remove all the, the extra crap and leave you with what is really important. So, so one of the reasons it's very different is that I did take the time. This book's taken longer to create and put together than my other books, even though I've written uh, millions of words by now. And I did it for just lots of reasons. I did it so that it would feel like innovation and creativity. I did it so that it would be accessible and shareable. You, you got through it in, on your first read in less than two hours. But let me ask you, Nick, have you read cover to cover all the books that you have bought on innovation? Uh, no. And uh, there's, there's a big pile of books that I always say I'm, I'm about to get to. 
but finding the time to read is one of my biggest challenges. So there's a lot of knowledge there that's still going unharnessed. Yes, it, it, if indeed, it, it, I mean, we assume, at least for me, I mean, I'm not going to angle to it, but I, I have maybe like you, I have thousands, thousands of books on a huge bookshelf over there. And the, some of them are, I think, are essentially the same book bought again on the same subject. And so you get a general idea that they have said something different and you read the intro and then you skim the rest. But you haven't read the rest. And in effect, they've put a barrier between you, the reader, and knowledge. Uh, I mean, I am not going to blame myself every time a book bounces me off it. And I'm not going to blame... There, there's a section in this book about making the pill easier to swallow, making your idea easier to swallow. And I thought, well, who is responsible for that? Is that me as an author that somebody didn't read my book? Or is it them as a reader that I, they didn't read the book? It surely, it must be partly my responsibility to not only make the ideas useful in themselves, but to make them as easy to access as possible so that maybe, Nick, even, you, you'll go back to it, that it would be part of your life, that the three jobs you'd actually recall and say, but what, what were the three jobs again? You know, I have a lot of information, but I don't have a big enough network, a brain, as I call it. I don't have enough people working with me. I don't have a collaborator or I do have uh, a colla collaboration, but for some reason we keep failing. Why is that? It must be strategic. Do we not have enough power on hand? So these three jobs of an innovator, and it really is the innovator's book. Uh, and that means it's for people who want to innovate, for people who need to innovate, and then for groups of innovators to work together, whether they're interested naturally or they're not. Normally, you have this big gap. You have people who are interested in innovation, and then you have everybody else that's normal in an organization. And you have this one person just chirping on, going, blah, 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 innovation, blah, 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 blue ocean, blah, 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 you know, whatever it is. And, and they feel isolated. If they follow the, the principles in this book, honest, I promise you, the difference will be huge. I've road tested it and it will make a big difference regardless of which stage you're at you'll find a principle that's worth it and you need to unpack it and use it rather than just look for an example thrill to the excitement of somebody else being successful and mention amazon over and over and over again instead become an innovator and that's what this book's about so what do you think causes this innovators gap that you're referring to what what do you mean is the gap specifically and what's the background behind it well, i think what one innovators gap is that there's uh, I, I don't know who will be watching this discussion whether they'll be part of what we could term the innovation professionals or there'll be people who are just innovate interested generally say my audience in being successful through their life and work. So let, let, let's talk to both of them. I think the, the actually probably the innovation gap is between those two. The gap might be between you as an innovation professional, maybe you become chief innovation officer of a small or huge company. They say they're taking innovation seriously. They write the pillar, an innovation pillar, and they come up with some training and they talk about an innovation culture. But it's all technical language over here. So it's either theory or it's a technical language that acts as a barrier between you and actual innovation. If you go through the case studies, the stories, I love the stories of the innovation and invention, you will find that they never start that story with <laughs> detailed understanding of innovation models. Yeah. Yeah. So if you read, say, um, Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean Strategy, I like that book. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a cool book. Some people do, some people don't. Done very well. Kim and Mabon. So Blue Ocean Strategy, you read it. They then come up with a whole set of case studies and they push those case studies into their model. And they say, well, the reason that uh, Cirque du Soleil was successful is it was a Blue Ocean Strategy company. But Cirque du Soleil did not start by reading Kim and Mo Bourne's book. 
they were not Kim and Mo Bourne's plans. So whatever happened there, it didn't come as a result of the book. You, you, yeah, I do. I, 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 I really resonate with that example because uh, one of the theories I really like is the 10 types of innovation that I used extensively in my work with Deloitte, uh, where they've got hundreds of case studies of companies that have done one or several of the 10 types of innovation. Yes. But none of those companies did it because of the 10 types of innovation framework. So it was the, the, the method and the framework wasn't necessarily the basis of those innovations. No, not at all. So it's post, post hoc categorization. Yeah. So after the fact, you put them in the pools. And I can, I can do that too. I'm sure I have done it in some of my books somewhere. I've said this is an example of a high adaptability organization or this is an example of an idea toxic organization. This is why I think that they failed. But they have not failed or succeeded, those companies, because of these ideas. Uh, they have, well, occasionally companies die because of ideas. So if you look at a company like Motorola, it had a lot of problems because it followed Six Sigma religiously and confused method with outcome. Uh, and it followed religiously and slavishly a method, but it didn't help save it. I mean, mother care in the UK has just gone bust. And I assume that there was somebody following one of these training programs we've just talked about. So why did they fail? You know, they, they failed because they failed to adapt. And they didn't find a new insight. They didn't respond to a wave of change. They didn't get their pe enough people involved or, or that there was a, some kind of barrier between the idea people and the doing people. You know, it's real world is what leads to innovation or innovation failure. And that's what this book's about. So we can have this discussion. You can turn to a page and chat with your team. You can buy a book that they can finish in two hours and you can expect them to, rather than them having to lie to you about having read some really long and boring book that we might love. And, and what, still, ab what about the companies that are doing innovation without really understanding the frameworks and the methods? Well, you know what I worry about there, apart from the waste of time, uh, is that a certain type of person loves innovation and a certain kind of person wants to solve things. They're, they're different. But then there's a third kind who just really wants to manage and control. And what I worry about sometimes is that third person who wants to manage control and have everything neat and tidy, they now are taking over the organized, hierarchical, formal, tradi new traditional, new normal innovation management. So they're no different to that old version of manager. It's just that we've stuck innovation onto their title. And wouldn't that be a shame? if the actual innovation became creativity training down at the bottom, put them through the sheet wash, and up at the top, it became just normal leadership, normal management, very dull, very process driven. And then in the middle, instead of them being unleashed, they're just squashed or abandoned, either squashed by the process or abandoned because there's nothing helping them at all. That, I think, worries me because there are quite a few problems that need solving in the world. Big ones and small ones. Small ones like making sure people have got jobs. Big ones like, you know, not, not burning the planet up in climate change, as an example, or figuring out how to share the, the stuff we've got so uh, people lead good lives. And I think there, if you're squashed by the process or you're abandoned by the process, that, again, is an innovation gap. So, you know, we could start creating a model here together, Nick. Absolutely. Live. <laughs> yeah, so, so what have we got? We've got the gap between, I think, We've, we've got uh, sort of hierarch yeah. hierarchical levels, yeah. which are divided by some sort of process column, and uh, yeah. they're just really not effectively connected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I'm sure this is thrilling for people on the podcast uh, to listen to us no, but I, I think trying to design for, things well, I think it's good we're talking. We're, at, you know, you Absolutely. start to say, but, but, but what is what? What are you trying to do that is not working? Yeah. Whatever objectives I have or objectives you have or the people listening, you, you say, it, it, I mean, clearly in here, you, I mean, imagine it. You say, innovators make the world go round. 
have a meeting about that, you know, with your people. Yeah. Just say, innovation makes the world go round. Since the beginning of humans with their first modern human brains, we've been putting ideas together, um, uh, so, uh, uh, let's say so semantic ensembles, neuronal ensembles, we're putting ideas together, we're reconnecting them, we're creating, have a talk about it, say, well, how are we doing? You know, do, where, where, where's that working? And then turn the page and say, you know, so some of the, what ideas have we got? Ideas are like babies, ugly, beautiful, but not finished yet. Let me listen to your idea. Let us develop that idea together. Sorry, I hadn't realized what you meant. I mean, I'd love that to be said around the place. Sorry, Nick, I didn't know what you were talking about. I just didn't understand. It could have been a great idea, but to be honest, mate, I wasn't even listening. Yeah. Or I've got this idea. I've kept it to myself. It's my insight. I've never shared it because it's a bit personal, you know, like it matters to me. I've never shared it. I feel this is a safe space. Let's not do post-it notes. But Nick, could you just listen to me? This book really matters to me. You know, whatever the idea is, listen, you know. And so, both of us conclude, Nick, I didn't realize it wasn't finished yet, your idea. I well, judged it they, before I should ever are. <laughs> they're, they're always evolving. <laughs> yeah, Whether yeah. And finished. then you turn the next page, don't you? And you go wherever it is. I'm doing this clearly deliberately. You know, beautiful ideas are never perfect, Nick. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. That's what you said. So that means that this podcast could be better or that if we want to compete with somebody else who's got something we want, it's good because their idea is never perfect. Oh, exactly. by the way, every piece of every image in here really is a work of art, either by me or someone else. Yeah. So they've been created by people. It's been a fabulous experiment. I hope you can tell. This uh, is no, a, I, a, a I, book I did that get gives I really, me joy. <laughs> I, I really got the sense when I was going through it that uh, there was a lot more thought behind it than some of the short books that you see just being pumped out sometimes, and some of the long books the textbook style of books that have got 400 pages uh, where it's just repeating the same case studies that everyone's heard before and that don't necessarily help individuals and companies improve on the problems that they're having. No, no, they don't. So, you know, we've got the gap between in a real world innovation and explanations of real world innovation. I'd hate, wouldn't it be awful if the industry Industries, as you know, especially advice industries, that sometimes they exist to help people genuinely. Yeah. And sometimes they exist to make people helpless. Yeah. They exist to make people feel they can't without my permission. Uh, and I, I, I want to help people with the knowledge I've acquired. I don't know, in computer science and psychology and strategy innovation, I want, and my experience, to help somebody get to where they couldn't have got to without my help and to become independent and confident in that ability. I don't want somebody to just be dependent on me and make me help them think that they need me to do things they could have done for themselves. I, I find that you know, infantilizing. I don't do it to my children and I wouldn't do it to a client or to a person who's listening to this. You can do it. And you'll probably be able to, there'll be billions made if money's your thing, or there'll be scientific discoveries made and brought out into the world. I work with lots of big pharma companies and startups as, as well, without any help from any of us. So let, first, let's not cause a problem. First, do no harm as an innovation person, and then see if you can help somebody get somebody better. There's a lot of work for us to do. Absolutely. It's what I strive to do every day. Um, so I, I, I've really enjoyed our chat. I know we're coming up to the end, uh, but I just wanted to get your insights as you were going through this process of really condensing down a lot of the knowledge you've gained over uh, all of the years that you've been working in this field. What, what sort of insights did you find that you hadn't necessarily thought about? Things that made you think about innovation and creativity and, and working as a team on new ideas differently? I think at this time, I did spend quite a lot of, one, that it's iterative, that you really have to go back again to the start. At the end of the book, I, I say that it's, a, it's not the end. Start again. 
And what, what I really enjoyed here is exploring my own innovation journey from the start and noting at all the way through that process, these three jobs, stuff that I needed to do again. That, for instance, uh, over the know, 30 years or so that I, I've been working in innovation and strategy in some way or other. And I hadn't remembered how many people I had not gone back to that, that I really liked, that I'd worked with, that I hadn't gone back to and learned from, you know, 30 years ago. So I had neglected a bit my bigger brain, that there were people out there who liked me, liked my work, I'd like them and I'd like my work. And I thought, we could achieve much more if I spend more time reaching out to them, you know, for both of us. So I've, this has really encouraged me to have the beer, have the coffee, have the chat, send the book, be friendly, you know, not, not be so cagey. Uh, be, be, so, so a lot of friendships and business friendships that were rekindled uh, and continue to be in this process. Also at the start, I talk about the need to hustle and to, be, to get the, the idea out there and to sell and to be willing to be sort of criticized for being enthusiastic and not sitting back and just saying, hey, I'm one of the world's leading authorities. I mean, if that gets you off, sure. Uh, but I get off on making a difference and seeing somebody look back and say, you know, thank you, Max, you've been part of this journey for years with us and we've really achieved a great deal. So, so all of that hustling, hassling, that you're never too big, too successful to uh, start again and to keep pushing. Uh, and uh, and sharing and hopefully you know, really making a difference. Fantastic. Max, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Uh, I'll make sure to get a link down in the description of where you can get a new copy of the book. Do we book. have to go like that? <laughs> you always got to always gotta go down. Subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. subscribe. Don't it. forget to subscribe and share as well. To, um, yeah, to there. And click on that link. <laughs> uh, well, I, he, I've just watched the Logan Paul um, KSI stuff over the weekend. Yeah. It's not, I mean, now I'm going to disassociate myself. It's not that I'm particularly fans or not. I, was, I haven't followed their whole journey. But think the energy they got for what was only a boxing match between two YouTubers. Yeah. And so if you think your idea is worth anything, why, haven't you, why aren't you putting that kind of energy into it? They've exactly. attracted thing, something to, to, to themselves. Good on them. 150 million spent on them over the weekend. If you've got an idea why sharing, then copy their, copy their skills. Be enthusiastic, Absolutely. be energetic. So yeah, <laughs> great to talk to you. Great to talk to you. Uh, and if people want to find out more about you and your work, uh, then what's the best place they can find that out? I think uh, LinkedIn, a lot of people listening to this will be business people. I probably am most active there. So if you come and find me on LinkedIn, then there'll be video to tools, all that, that, that stuff. But also, to, you know, ask me a question uh, and get involved. Fantastic. Max, it's been wonderful speaking with you and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Okay, you too. Take care, Nick. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.